pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Hello, Booktube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. It's Sunday night. I'm feeling better. I just poured myself my first glass of wine of the evening and definitely not my last. Perfect frame of mind in which to do a book haul. So over the past few months, changing apartments, uh, not including the books I bought in Canada when I went home to, for the wedding, but a lot of Amazon purchases and Kinokuniya bookstore here in, at Shinjuku in Tokyo having 20% off sales and whatnot, I've accumulated a shitload of new books. So you gotta promise not to tell Kenji. <laughs> How many I bought. Like I say, this doesn't include the suitcase of books I brought back from Canada. And I'm dying to tell you about them. They're not in any particular order, but uh, this is Edouard Louis' second novel, at least second novel translated into English, History of Violence. And this one is about uh, violent sexual assault, I, I, I believe a rape that Edouard Louis endured. And I loved his first novel, The End of Eddie, not because it was a wonderful novel per se, but because it had one of the most searing and honest, unflinching portrayals of gay shame that I have ever read in fiction. So I value it highly for that, and I hear, uh, at least from Chris of Chris Booker's Cauldron, that this is similarly powerful. The problem I have with Edward Louis is uh, he's really writing memoirs and calling them novels, and I, I don't understand why you'd do that. But Maybe it's a French thing I don't understand, but I'm looking forward to reading this. It's probably not going to be an easy read, but... And I'm only going to read you opening paragraphs or sentences when they have some kind of a standalone oomph to them. I am hidden on the other side of the door. I listen, and she says that several hours after what the copy of the report I keep twice folded in my drawer calls the attempted homicide and which I call the same thing for lack of a better word, since no other term is more appropriate for what happened, which means I always have the anxious, nagging feeling that my story, whether told by me or whomever else, begins with a falsehood. I left my apartment and went downstairs. I'm a little nervous about this one. It was a total cover buy. Look at that. And Eric Carl Anderson loves it, which doesn't always mean that I'm going to love it. In fact, uh, less than 50% of the time it means that. But I've decided what I'd like to do is start with some of her Olivia Lang's nonfiction. Her one about being a flaneuse. The Lonely City sounds really interesting. This one is kind of based on Kathy Acker. And it's kind of an autobiographical novel, but through the persona of Kathy Acker. And the more I hear about it, I'm a little nervous that that isn't necessarily going to add up to being a Sean book. And the opening sentences uh, don't soothe those qualms. Listen to this. I don't think they're horrible sentences. They just seem a little bit awkward to me. And like I say, just kind of exacerbate my anxiety about whether this is going to work for me. Kathy, by which I mean I, was getting married. Kathy, by which I mean I, had just got off a plane from New York. It was 1945 on the 13th of May, 2017. She'd been upgraded to business. She was feeling fancy. She bought two bottles of duty-free champagne in orange boxes. That was the kind of person she was going to be from now on. Okay, I find that by which I mean I horrendously awkward as an opening scene or uh, opening few sentences of a novel, but I'm going to keep it open mind. And in the meantime, look at that cover. I've never read any Kathy Acker, and I hear she's not much of a writer, but uh, I'm sure there are other opinions out there. This one was on my uh, Goodreads TBR for years, and I kept waiting for it to come down in price on Amazon, and it finally did where I felt like I could afford it. The Gypsy Moth Summer by Julia Fierro. 2017 novel, Julia Fierro lives in Brooklyn and Los Angeles. The protagonist uh, family home, they were a rich family, lived on Avalon Island, an I not an island, an islet off the East Coast. And the only daughter of this prominent family has returned home with her African-American husband 
and her biracial children, and all hell breaks loose in the summer of 1992. So that sounds pretty darn interesting, and I have done the page 112 test, and it passed with flying colors. This is going to, I, th I think this is going to be a buddy read between Britta Bowler and I, maybe before the end of the year, but certainly early next year. Here's the opening paragraph. I think it packs quite a punch. Before that summer of 92, when the gypsy moths swarmed Avalon Island and Leslie Day Marshall, golden-headed prodigal daughter, returned with her black husband and brown children to claim her seat as first lady, the island's crimes were minor. Teenagers breaking into a newly constructed mansion to throw a kegger, a maid stealing from her mistress, East High's quarterback wrapping his shiny Mustang, a graduation present from his grandfather, around the ancient oak tree on Snake Hill, and occasionally a neighbor, the investment banker, disappearing for six months, only to return lean and fit after a stay at a low-security prison. It's a bit of a cover by, but uh, I like what I've read of it and haven't heard very much, but it haven't heard anything negative about it, so I'm looking forward to it. It's a chunkster. Look at this baby. This is volume two of My Brother's Husband, the manga, translated into English, by uh, written and drawn by Gengoro Tagame. I read and loved the first volume and was delighted that this second volume is now available. So delighted that I didn't wait for it to come down in price, so I better damn well read it now that it's arrived, maybe last week before it goes down in price, because I could have saved money, but I'm actually dying to, to continue the story. I found it really touching and such an important story for Japan and Japanese culture because, be just because I know Japanese culture to the degree that an expatriate could ever know it quite well, and Japan needs gay stories like this. And this just arrived in the mail the other day. This was a book trade with longtime subscriber of m of my channel and many of your many other booktube channels Sonia and she has just started up her own channel which I really love her channel is called an enthusiastic reader I'll put the link in the show notes and I sent her a copy of an early John Williams novel the author of Stoner which is one of my favorite novels but his, uh, an early novel of his that failed the page 112 test so abysmally that I really regretted spending $12 to buy it new so she uh, expressed an interest in it and so I sent her that and she sent me this which is on my Goodreads TBR Mad Boy by Nick Arvin new novel from Europa set in the War of 1812 the only thing that turns me off is they've got a little tag an account of Henry Phipps in the War of 1812 I hate when literary novels do that it's so cheap you don't need a tag for a literary novel but usually have good luck with Europa editions. Henry Phipps runs through the shadows under great trees. He's angry. Someone has lied. The slave Radner has lied to Henry, or someone has lied to Radner. Some liar has lied to someone a terrible lie. He runs through wet heat and spongy mud, through clouds of gnats and sprays of pale flowers. A small boy, lean like a figure cut from a length of wood too thin for the intended shape. He wears a shirt that's scarcely more than sacking with buttons, trousers patched in several places and cinched by a rope belt, boots with a hole in one toe. No hat. Mad Boy by Nick Arvin. Anybody read it? This was a Blame It on Curtis Books and Books by... On Chesil Beach by Ian McEwen. I have been whining about how much I hated McEwen's novel Amsterdam. It's one of the books that I didn't bail on that I hated the most of my reading life. And Curtis, but other readers over the years have said, okay, fine, don't worry about that. Read On Chesil Beach. You have to read it. And so I picked it up. It's a short little novel, and I've got it on audio in on script, so I'm going to do an audio text combo one of these days, but I've got a nice attractive paperback edition. They were young, educated, and both virgins on this their wedding night, and they lived in a time when a conversation about sexual difficulties was plainly impossible. Oh my. 
This is an Iranian novel that I picked up in translation, also from Europa Editions at a recent book sale, 20% off sale at Kinokuniya Books. The Gardens of Consolation by Parisa Reza, translated by Adriana Hunter. And she translated uh, Emily Natom's Fear and Trembling, but I won't hold that against her. This was written in French. Uh, Reza was born in Tehran, 1965 and moved to France at the age of 17. So it was written in French, translated from the French, set in the 1920s in a remote village in Persia. Uh, and then has a bit of a historical sweep giving, uh, showing the rise of the Shah, the, the Reza Shah Pavlavi uh, dynasty. H has a great page 112, the uh, opening paragraphs don't have a standalone oomph, so I won't read those, but looking forward to trying it. This one is really curious. It's called Dictionary of the Khazars, a lexicon novel by Milorad Pavic, translated from the Serbo Croatian by Kristina Probidjevic Zoric. I'm sorry I didn't uh, do some research on that pronunciation. Published in 1988. Probably that's the translation publication. And what a strange novel this is. First of all, you have to know that Pavic published two versions of the novel, a male edition and the female edition. They are identical except for one paragraph. And I bought the female edition, of course but both were in the bookstore. That's a bit of a gimmick, but interesting. I'd like to find out more about that. It's set up kind of like a dictionary, and it's the story of the Khazar people as a novel. Now, I read another novel from this part of the world that was The Bridge Over the Drina. I've blanked on the, the, the author. that ended up devolving, from my perspective, devolving into a historical chronicle with no actual characters. I think this one's going to be different, or at least I hope so and very tentatively uh, have a buddy read. Unscheduled, but uh, maybe committed to with Britta Bowler for next year. There's a long prologue, which I won't read you an excerpt from, but I'll read you the excerpt from the first kind of part of the story called The Red Book. So it starts like a di dictionary entry. Atta, 9th century. The Khazar princess whose role in the polemic concerning the Khazar's conversion was decisive. Her name is taken to be the term for the Khazar's four states of consciousness. At night, she wore a single letter on each eyelid, inscribed as are those put on the eyelids of horses before a race. The letters came from the proscribed Khazar alphabet, in which each letter kills as soon as it is read. They were written by blind men, and the ladies-in-waiting shut their eyes when they attended to the princess in the morning before her bath. Thus, she was protected from her enemies while she slept. Yeah, this just sounds really intriguing. I mean, it may not work, but I'm really intrigued. Has anybody heard of this or read this? If so, which version did you read? Don't tell me about the difference between the male and female version, but I'm really curious to give this a try. Compared with Garcia Marquez and Borje, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. It's his first novel, I think, maybe his only novel. Interesting. Dictionary of the Khazars by Milorad Pavic. I couldn't resist picking this up. It's brand, uh, hot off the press. The Penguin Book of Japanese Short Stories, edited by J. Rubin and introduced by uh, Haruki Murakami. And it is a chunkster, almost 500 pages, an anthology of obviously uh, Japanese stories in translation. And one thing that I really love about the Kinokuniya books is they have a really good points system. So I was able to buy this, I think it's a $40 book, entirely on points that I had accumulated in the previous year. So go me! Look at all that pink! This was not a cover buy so much as a title buy. Look at the title, Future Popes of Ireland by Dara Martin. I think I found out about this because John Boyne reviewed it, and it actually really reminds me of his humor. Now, I have a love-hate relationship with John Boyne's works based on the two novels I've read, but his The Heart's Invisible Furies was my top read of last year. And this one kind of reminds me of that, the humor. I think it's a gay story, but I think I got that out of reading John Boyne's review, but maybe I've forgotten. 
and this is his uh, Martin's first adult novel. He's written novels for children. The opening premise is that in 1979, Bridget Doyle has one goal left in life, for her family to produce the very first Irish Pope. But there's a problem with... Oh yeah, it says right here that uh, one of the, her grandson that she has all her hopes pinned on ends up being gay. So yeah, it sounds like quite a romp. And listen to the opening sentence. It was September 1979 when Pope John Paul II brought sex to Ireland. That totally jibes with uh, my memory of the irreverence of Boyne's uh, The Heart's Invisible Furies. Let's not talk about the absolutist. Looking forward to giving this one a try. Blame it on Matthew Sharapa, who's been raving about this book. I've actually stopped listening to what he's saying because I want to read it. So this is the thing that I do with new releases, and I'm going to be talking a lot more about this in some year-end videos, so stay tuned. But I either have to read the book immediately, in which case I just stop listening to stuff, or just decide that I'm not going to read it for two, three, four, five years. But I want to read this. I'm doing it as a buddy read with Kendra Winchester in November, and I'm so stoked. The Court Dancer by Kyung Suk Shin, translated by Anton Her. And then I'll go back and watch all of Matthew Sharapa's reviews and stuff. A bit of a cover by. It's a gorgeous hardcover. And it's about a mysterious dancer in the uh, Korean royal court in the dying days of the Korean Empire. And uh, it sounds really, really great, so can't wait to read it. This is a Blame It on the Book of Forgotten Authors by Christopher Fowler purchase. London Belongs to Me by Norman Collins. I think it was published in 1945, and it's termed a city... Yep, published 1945. Termed a city novel, and it's a chunkster, 700 pages. Opens in 1938, where the prospect of war is hanging over the city and the country and it's set in kind of the working class lodging house in Kensington and all of those characters. The mini essay about Norman Collins in the book of forgotten authors piqued my interest and right now what I'm really looking for is a buddy reader. Please apply below, not apply. Please indicate your interest below. This was not a cover buy. I, I think it was just a page 112 buy. It was a new release at Kinokuniya Books a few weeks ago. Eleanor or the Rejection of the Progress of Love by Anna Mostrovakis. She is a New York State writer. This is her debut, I think, and I believe it has a lesbian theme. 2018 novel, and it passed the page 112 test. Here are the opening lines. The story she was reading was about a 43-year-old unarmed civilian shot to death in a Tampa Bay movie theater by a 72-year-old retired police captain who had become irritated by the man during previews. Eyewitnesses said the victim had been texting loudly. Popcorn had been thrown. She looked down from the screen at the bead of blood on her thumb. She watched it form a rivulet that ran down her palm and into the white down comforter her friend had laid out on the bed for a Ukrainian folk singer arriving that night to teach a workshop in village holos at a nearby club. The blood formed a spot brighter than the bead itself. He was a good genuine person it was said of the deceased. He was just a funny guy. He brought life into every room. Fate brought these two people together. It was ridiculous. It's a bit of an enigmatic opening. The page 112 was quite enigmatic too. I will let you know how I make out with it. This is another NYRB books book, The Seventh Cross by Anna Segers, translated from the German by Margot Bettauer Dembo, originally published in 1946 in German. And this is about the rise of Nazism in Germany. Oh, first published in 1942. So maybe the original translation was 1946. And this is a new translation. So when was this newest translation by Dembo done? 2018. Okay. Britta, Mel, what do you know about this book? Opening paragraph. Probably no trees ever cut down in our country were as unique, as strange, as the seven plain trees growing at the gable end of barracks three. Their crowns, for a reason to be revealed at a later time, 
had previously been cut off, and a board had been nailed across each of the tree trunks at shoulder height. From afar, the seven plain trees looked like seven crosses. Cover by Daisy Johnson's Everything Under. Don't tell Adam of Memento Mori that I considered this to be a cover by. It's on some prize list or other. It's her debut novel. Her, her uh, short story collection was called Finn. And I've heard very extremely mixed reviews, but I want to give it a try. I like this little opening paragraph set off. It's not an epigraph, it's, so it must be her own writing, and I, it's quite a lovely way to start the novel. The places we are born come back. They disguise themselves as migraines, stomach aches, insomnia. They are the way we sometimes wake, falling, fumbling for the bedside lamp, certain everything we've built has gone in the night. We become strangers to the places we are born. They would not recognize us, but we will always recognize them. They are marrow to us. They are bred into us. If we were turned inside out, there would be maps cut into the wrong side of our skin, just so we could find our way back. Except, cut wrong side into my skin are not canals and train tracks and a boat, but always you. Now that makes me want to read more. Two more. This is another one that I blame on Christopher Fowler's The Book of Forgotten Authors of Love and Hunger by Julian McLaren Ross, published around the same time as London Belongs to Me, 1947. And a similar kind of setting and theme, Julian McLaren Ross, there he is, was a part of the great bohemian milit uh, literary movement of 1940s London, a dandy and a raconteur. And this is also set, set during the Depression and also perhaps set in a boarding house. I think that his sensibility might be quite different from Norman Collins, but kind of similar cast of characters. But looking forward to giving it a try. And last, but certainly not least, is The Waves by Virginia Woolf. I have another copy somewhere in a box in Canada, perhaps, that I read in the 1990s. I read it after I finished university. Uh, I read it in between my undergrad days and my graduate days, and I absolutely loved it. And I remember trying to have a conversation about why I loved it with my dear friend and cousin Mary Jean, who's a very bookish person. And I remember my voice got all choked up and I was just so moved trying to talk about what this book meant to me. But all these years later, I can remember almost nothing about it. And it's Eric Carl Anderson's favorite novel. And I love Virginia Woolf. And I think that if I just read a couple more by her, I will be ready to declare from the, from the mountaintops that Virginia Woolf is my favorite writer. So I'm dying to reread this. And my plan is to reread it in December after about 30 years and then immediately reread Lenny Zumas's Red Clocks, which I read just a few months ago. Because according to Eric, it's a kind of intertext. There's a Red Clocks was inspired by this novel. My memory of this was so dim when I read Red Clocks that I, I couldn't make the connection, so I'm anxious to do that. The sun had not yet risen. The sea was indistinguishable from the sky, except that the sea was slightly creased, as if a cloth had wrinkles in it. Gradually, as the sky whitened, a dark line lay on the horizon, dividing the sea from the sky, and the gray cloth became barred with thick strokes, moving, one after another, beneath the surface, following each other, pursuing each other, perpetually. Yeah, I can't wait to fall back into this novel. All right, so that's my book haul. Which of these have you read? Which of these would you be most likely to want to try? I think I should stop buying books for six months and read all these. What do you think? Do you think I can do it? Do you think I will do it? Thanks for watching.